Good Gram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Right, a week seems to go by pretty quickly these days. <laughs> Doesn't feel like uh, five minutes ago it was uh, last Sunday and I was uh, doing uh, another episode of the show. But anyway, um, so this week's episode of the show, we're carrying on the theme of looking at uh, new independent bottling companies, or should I say new independent bottling companies. To me, yeah, the company has been around for quite a few years now and the company I'm referring to is called The Single Cask. Now, that kind of gives away what they do I suppose, but um, wasn't uh, always quite like that. And it's the interesting thing with independence, they seem to sort of not necessarily follow a particular trend with how they're set up. Um, they either sort of tend to sort of work um, a bit like, well, I suppose if you go back to um, sort of Victorian times, that kind of thing, they obviously grew out of the whole blending market. Um, and, you know, then you had sort of certain companies like, for example, Murray McDavid, Duncan Taylor, that were originally private collections of casks that were then bottled and the business kind of grew, I suppose, almost organically. And then you have sort of like the, the, the new crop of... Um, of independence, a bit like sort of Claxton's North Star, where they'll be set up by someone either that has some or no experience of the whiskey industry whatsoever, and is just really into whiskey, buys casks, bottle them. You know, at the end of the day, like I said, uh, I think previously, um, all it takes to set up an independent bottling company is, uh, is a few contacts and, uh, and a shed load of money, really, at the end of the day. Um, but Every now and again you come across a company that's done things just a little bit differently and, and this is uh, the, the way of the, the single cask um, company. Um, originally it was set up as a company called um, Malt Vault uh, by a chap called Ben Curtis in 2010 and it appears this Malt Vault company was um, a cask broker, um, an investment um, company, uh, you could buy casks from them, uh, and, and you still can in actual fact, for I think the princely sum of around about three grand will get you a, a cask, I would imagine, of either new make or fairly young spirit of um, maybe not such a well-known distillery, but you know, you can get your hands on a cask for, for a relatively small amount. And so, this particular company, Cask uh, Malt, Malt Vault, had, seemed to be predominantly based in, in Singapore and it seemed to have uh, the agency for distribution of a number of brands and things like that in Singapore. And um, it wasn't until 2012 that they uh, introduced the, the, the bottling range, the single cask um, label. And I'm guessing it's basically like a lot of these companies is a kind of, well, we've got all these casks, um, why not bottle them ourselves, you know, and, and why not? So not only did they sort of start bottling uh, the casks that they that, that Ben um, owned, uh, they also opened a bar in Singapore called the, um, I think it was called the, uh, the, the, the Single Cask as well, or something of that kind of ilk. Um, and subsequently they've rolled these out, so I think there's one in London and I think there's one that's just opened in Stamford in Lincolnshire, just down the road. So, um, the I, I, I like the kind of concept of it. I mean, not only is it that are they brokers and, and bottlers, they have... Um, you can sign up to their, their whiskey club and pay them some money each month or every two months and get a bottle, a random bottle sent. I mean, personally, it's not my kind of thing. I'd, I'd like to know what I'm buying. But, you know, if you're kind of into that sort of thing, then all the information is, is on their website. And um, I'm guessing now that they're, they're attempting to ex sort of expand their um, stockists kind of beyond just their own bars and their website and things like that. And, and this, like I said, until um, uh, I was contacted by, by Ben, I hadn't heard of them. Um, they've probably been just sort of merrily doing their own little thing for the last handful of years. But like I said, you know, uh, um, nothing wrong in, in sort of wanting to expand your stockists. And uh, um, obviously to that end, I have a selection of samples. Some of these bottles or samples were bottled last year, some have only just recently been bottled, but uh, uh, we'll, um, we'll have a look at them and, um, yeah, I'll uh, taste them and let you know what I think. <laughs> right, okay, so we have quite, um, what's the word for it, uh, eclectic mix of, of bottlings uh, to share with you guys today. We're going to kick off with a McDuff. 
Yeah, I'm reviewing a McDuff now. Um, as, as a number of you know, uh, McDuff is it's my favourite distillery ever. Yeah. Um, the thing is, with, with, with members of the Axis of Evil, as you well know, um, they often live up to or live down to their, their, their billing, shall we say. Um, but every now and again, it's, I, I like tasting them just to hope that every now and again they might throw me a curveball. I might get a sort of like a, a pleasant uh, um, Lecce, for example, or I might get a pleasant Jura or something of that kind of ilk. Or, heaven forbid, a pleasant bloody McDuff, or even a sort of a vaguely palatable McDuff would actually do. But anyway, um, so this is a 19-year-old uh, McDuff. It is a uh, bottle of 53.5, was distilled in 1997, bottled last year, and the cask number is 5278. So, well, that be an interesting start, I think. Next bottle we're going to be moving on to is uh, a Milton Duff. This is a 21-year-old Milton Duff. It was bottled in February of uh, this year, uh, distilled in February of 1995, and the cast number is 2594, bottled at 45.8. So, um, could be interesting. M uh, Milton Duff is you know, a fairly consistent uh, distillery as regards to quality, so uh, that should be interesting. Now, the third bottling is a bottling you don't see very often, an independent Tommy tool. I mean, as you well know, Tom and Tool stopped selling casks to uh, All and Sundry a number of years ago, so uh, it's always a, a little bit, a bit of a bit of a shock to see one bottled by the Independents. So this is actually a 22 year old. Uh, it was distilled in 1995, bottled in 2017. Cask number 2156, bottled at 53.2. So. Um, as you know, I love Tom and Tom, so let's hope that this one's a good one then, shall we? Uh, the fourth bottling we'll be looking at is uh, an Invergordon Grain. Uh, this is a 27-year-old, distilled in February of 1988, bottled in February of 2016. Cast number 8118, bottled at 45.8. Now, it's unusual to see a 27-year-old or mid-twenties grain bottling, bottling at up to 50%. So, um... Don't know if that's going to have any any bearing on the character of it, but uh, we shall see anyway. And uh, the penultimate bottling is the good old English whiskey. Now this is a seven-year-old peated. Uh, it was distilled in 2009, bottled uh, last year. Uh, cask number B446, bottled at 60%. And I'll tell you what, a lot of not a lot, not a lot of. There's a fair amount of English whisky casks sloshing about at the moment that are sub ten years old and that hit the sixty odd percent. So um, damn tight casks, I would imagine, on that particular one. And the interesting thing about the independents, of course, is they don't all just bottle um, whisky or grain. They also do rum and things like that. And uh, the the single cask uh, company is. Uh, no exception to that. So here we have uh, a 12 year old rum from the Diamond Distillery in Guyana, cast number 96, distilled in 2004, bottled in 2016 and bottled at 57%. So, so that's this afternoon's uh, range, so hopefully this should, should be interesting and um, well, deep breaths and uh, let's kick off with the uh, McDuff then. Right, okay, so <laughs> let's kick off with the uh, with the Macduff then. Hang on, I just had to sniff that again just to make sure that I, I wasn't actually dreaming. Um, there is actually some fruit here. There's some some lovely barley. There's some slightly straw-like kind of notes. And do you know what the main thing is that really gets me about this particular bottling? It is clean. There's no faintiness, there's no rubber, there's no burning tyres. You know, it is really clean, mature, probably smells a bit older than 19, I think. Um, it certainly has that kind of classically mature spay kind of character, like I said, the straw-like fruit, apricot, little touch of marzipan touch of herbal notes kind of coming through, sort of almost kind of rye like so it's a possibility that this may well have been matured in maybe a first or a second fill um, 
ex rye cask possibly. Quite multi, quite deep, quite dense. I mean, this is. I mean, Macduff is never going to be that sort of wonderfully perfumed, elegant style of malt. It's always going to be a bit of a bit of a workhorse. But I'll tell you what. They found a bloody good cask. That's all I can say. And I won't say that about Macduff very often. I can tell you that for a start. But you know, this is very pleasant, and it just goes to show you that every dog has its day. You know. Um, yeah, it's really very, very good. Let's uh, let's see what the palate's like. Oh, almost, almost tropical. Um, it's got a bit of a bite to it. it has to be said. There's a slight fieriness. Um, on the finish and um, but there's some lovely soft creamy oak um, a little bit of rye like um, herbal notes straw barley apricot mature character it's, like I said it's a bit hot on the finish um, but by god I'll forgive it for that um, I'm stunned I am absolutely stunned I mean that has got to be one of the best bottlings of Milton um, of Milton Duff um, of McDuff that I've come across in a long, long time, and um, I mean, yes, it's it's 53.5. I don't know whether I really ought to put any water. Well, I'm going to put a little drop of water and just see what happens. I mean, I hope to God this is not going to kind of kill it off. I mean, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but we shall just see uh, uh, if it does anything for it. Oh, that's nice, now. That's I don't think I when I actually tasted this the first time round. Uh, when I was composing my notes, um, I don't think I actually put any water with it, and it's done that kind of classic citrus thing. It's just gone luscious orange fruit. I mean, if I was tasting this blind, I would not have guessed this was McDuff. I mean, this is so un McDuff. I mean, stunning, absolutely fantastic, lovely sort of crystallised, uh, granulated sugar notes as well, and um, yeah, that's. Um, that's really nice. Let's see, let's see what the palette's like now then, shall we? Wow! Liquid orange, a little bit of honey, satsuma, tangerine, a little bit of granulated sugar now. I mean, damn! That's, I, I'm impressed, it has to be said. Very, very impressed. <laughs> Right, after that start, let's move on to the Milton Duff. So uh, uh, let's see if that um, that's equally as impressive. Quite oily, um, almost almost lanolin. Um, the classic kind of herbally malty, um, heathery kind of notes are certainly there. Again, quite a dense, quite a weighty spirit. Um, I mean, Milton Duff can be can be a little bit like Glengarry, I find, um, and it has, and, you know, it has a sort of um, a charm of its own. It has that, like I said, that kind of heathery, herbally, sort of Highlandy character. Really quite dense. Plenty of barley, subtle oak. The oak just kind of sitting back. Um, and just adding a little bit of structure, a touch of coffee, a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of toffee. That's a lovely nose. That is a really nice nose. Um, like I said, m pleasantly mature, quite weighty, dense. Yeah, I like that. That's that's an impressive uh, an impressive nose. Let's, uh, let's see what the palate's like and show it. That's a lovely finish. A little bit lighter on the palate, a little bit more fruit, a little bit more apricot, not quite so weighty, malty and oily. Um, a little bit more elegance, a touch of sugar, um, lovely, lightly smoked finish. Um, that is a beautiful finish. A little bit of mouth-watering citrus just kind of on the front of the palate, but it's not overly citric, but that just kind of adds that little sort of balancing edge to the um, 
to, to the fruit in actual fact and um, again Milton Duff can be quite quite fruity and quite herbal the palate isn't quite so herbal and there's, but there's a little bit of heatheriness um, but even so I mean that is a fantastic whiskey that is absolutely gorgeous and um, mm, I like that <laughs> Right, okay, so, so far so good, two out of two, um, let's, uh, let's see if the um, quality continues then shall we, so let's have a look at the, uh, the Tommy tool, let's see what nose gives us on this, lovely nose, um, very slightly tropical, maybe not quite as, as rich as say the distillery bottling might be, but um, this has got some lovely mature honey touch of sawdusty oak just a little bit not not a huge amount again the oak is quite sat back this has obviously been a well refill uh, American oak cask there is some vanilla a little bit of toffee a little bit of herbal notes kind of coming through it's got that sort of lovely weight to it it's one of the more weightier space side whiskies um, some lovely barley character, some lovely maturity, but not too mature. If you kind of get my drift on that one, um, yeah, that's that's a lovely nose. That really is impressive. And if you love old American oak um, weighty space signs, this is definitely going to be up your street. Yeah, that's that's a good nose. Let's, let's see what the palate's like then, shall we? Mm, that's got a lovely progression. A little bit more oak centric at the beginning, a bit more vanilla. Comes through with some apricot, some grass, um, sort of dried grass, more sort of somewhere between dried grass and straw. Um, apricots, rich fruit, um, real citric finish, a real sort of alcohol enhanced citrus, grippy mineral. Mm finish that's got a bit drying but lovely intensity really really good and that's what I love I, I mean I, I mean some people don't kind of get that sort of you know citric intense crisp finish or the sometimes a bitter oak kind of finish but I like it as long as it's not too OTT as long as it's all yeah you know, palate cleansing and finishing you just sort of go mm, that's nice um, and it's got a lovely progression a nice maturity um, well rounded and like I said uh, it's not very often you come across a, an ind independently bottled uh, Tommy tool um, so I think in, in this instance I think um, yeah that's a, another damn good whiskey right ok so let's move on to the Inver Gordon grain let's uh, see what the news gives us on this one shall we it's relatively neutral I mean Invergordon is probably one of the more lighter sort of styles of uh, of grain, um, sort of more kind of Gervin than say Dumbarton, for example. Um, it's a nice smokiness, as um, which I'm guessing is probably more the oak than the actual spirit character. There's a touch of dried fruit. It's it's pleasant. Um, there's a touch of lemon. It's a bit neutral. It's a bit sort of. I won't quite say it's oak aged vodka, but it's got a little bit more to it than that. Um, but I think. I think I could have done with it a little bit more. You know, if you see what I mean. It's it's like it's not not bad at all. I mean, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and I love the smokiness, I love that sort of wood smoke kind of character, um, almost, like I said, almost like the sort of um, kind of smoked uh, oak aged vodka kind of um, thing. It's got a little bit of graininess, yeah, it's, uh, it's pleasant, um, let's see what the palette's like then, shall we?
Yeah, that smokiness has kind of carried on in the palette and comes through on the finish. It's all almost kind of like a, a coal dust kind of smoke note. Um, it's relatively simple, it has to be said. There's a little bit more weight on the palette. There's a little bit more dried fruit. Um, quality is fine. I've got no issue with that. I must admit I can't think off the top of my head what I'd have to retail it for. But um, I, I think I'd want a little bit more, shall we say. I mean, I, like I said, I don't think it's a bad whiskey at all. Uh, it's pleasant. Um, it's just a little bit too simple for me, um, you know, there's just, I just want a little bit more. I'm a bit of a fussy bugger when it comes to grain, I mean I love my grain whiskies, and I know it's difficult with grain because inherently the spirit itself really doesn't have a huge amount of character and you're looking for it to pick up wood notes, you're looking for it to pick up oxidation notes, that kind of thing, the sort of dried fruits. Um, and 27 is sort of mm, relatively young-ish you know, as you know, for uh, a grain whiskey, and it's possible that it's been bottled because the sort of the ABV has kind of dropped, um, and when ordinarily I think this could have probably done with a little bit longer, but the question is, you know, whether it would have ga got that kind of, or gathered that kind of oxidation character, which it doesn't really seem to have an awful lot of, but but like I said, I think as a sort of a grain whiskey in its own right, yeah, it's it's certainly pleasant, and I'm, maybe I'm being a bit sort of unduly hard on it. I I, I don't know, but uh, I certainly think that for me personally, I just want a little bit uh, a little bit more complexity. But you know, can't. can't. Right, okay, so let's move on to the peated English seven-year-old now. I, 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 think, I can't remember the last time I tasted a, a, a poor whiskey from, uh, you know, it was distilled at uh, the St George's Distillery, so I can't imagine this is going to be a, a first, shall we say, so, and indeed it isn't. Um, it's, now I, I, I love peated malts, and this has got a lot of peat, well no, not a lot of peat, I mean, you know, a reasonable amount of peat. Um, I mean, there's some lovely barley and there's some sweet fruits and the, the, the peat has that kind of almost medicinal isla kind of note to it. I mean, I, I always just prefer the unpeated English whiskey because of the character of the spirit. Um, and maybe if, if, if it was a, a little bit lighter peated, I don't know. It's just always seemed to be that... Um, the peat then becomes kind of like the focal point. I, mean, I suppose that's part of the point, isn't it? You know, it's um, I mean, for 60%, and I, I'm you know, going back to the, the the ABV, for 60%, this really doesn't smell like 60%. It's all well integrated. This, and that's the thing I've noticed about the English whiskey spirit is it seems to hold the alcohol well. Um, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of other distilleries, you'd be sort of sticking your nose in a 60% bottling of theirs and you'd be, you know, you'd just get the alcohol int intensely, but this is just all really well contained. There's a, a sliver of honey, possibly, um, and some lovely maturity as well. I mean, again, the English whiskey just feels older than its its actuality, and obviously that's partly down to the, the, the climate in Norfolk, it being a little bit warmer than it is, say, in Glasgow or Edinburgh, and so it's going to mature a little bit quicker. But it also seems to sort of get away with being bottled a little bit earlier in its uh, life, a bit uh, like sort of Colila or um, you know a few other uh, Scottish distilleries. But anyway, coming back to the uh, coming back to the whiskey, it's it's a lovely whiskey. It's a lovely balanced, not up too peaty, but peaty enough for those of you that love the peat, and um, just pleasantly intense. So that's a good nose. So let's see what the palate's going to give us. Now you can tell that's 60%. That's really quite drying, quite short, obviously. Again, the peak kind of coming through on the finish with a, a dusty kind of coal dust. There's a little bit of tar, a little bit of a little bit of salt as well. Um, it's got some lovely weighty barley. Um, I think that definitely needs a little drop of water. Uh, although the, the spirit itself is absolutely spot on. Really, really clean, really impressive. Um, 
I, I love their, their whiskey. <laughs> you know, it's, they're just producing some absolutely fantastic whiskey. Um, peat has obviously dropped off a little bit now that you put a drop of water with it. I'm getting a lot more of the American oak. I'm getting more of the barley, sort of summery fruits, apricot, sort of yellow, sort of uh, fruit notes. Yeah, it's got some lovely sweet oak kind of coming through now. That really kind of opens up the nose amazingly well, which is not a surprise. I mean, you know, 60% alcohol, it's going to be pretty damn tight. Um, a little bit of almost kind of wood spice there now. Just, just such a lovely spirit, it has to be said anyway. Let's uh, see what the palate's like now. Really showing the oak now. Soft and creamy and gentle. A um, little bit of citrus, a little bit of white fruit. Um, again, the peat is, is kind of lessened a little bit, although it does kind of come through again quite intensely on the finish with that sort of more dusty kind of character. Um, full, oh, that is just that is just such a lovely whiskey, it has to be said. And yeah, um, if you've never had an English whiskey, if you've one of these people that thinks um, whiskey only gets made in Scotland, then I really, th you, you need to think again. I mean, yeah, and I can't imagine there's too many of you that do <laughs> that watch the the show because I've reviewed whiskies from all over the world, and you know, not so long ago the Paul John range, uh, um, English whiskey, Langerton from Switzerland, and what have you. And uh, you know, there's some great whiskies being being made around the world. It's not just a, all about Scotland. And oh, that's just fantastically good that is lovely whiskey and you know and it goes to show you that at the end of the day age is really just a number i mean it's not no age statement whiskey obviously but you know it's it doesn't have to be sort of you know particularly old to be particularly good there's the point right okay so let's move on to the rum now it's always a bit tricky when you sort of have a, a different uh, spirits to sort of where to sort of stick them and uh, I think I think probably doing maybe in, oh, I've done the maybe I've done the peated one at the end I don't know but um, anyway the, the rum has got I think a sort of a distinctive enough character sort of uh, to, uh, to, to to go right at the end so anyway let's uh, let's see what the nose gives us oh, pungent classic Guyana oily intense pulped fruit it's got that almost kind of cane pulped cane sugar not quite agricoli but pulped cane sugar but as as we know uh, from the El Dorado tasting uh, there is uh, their, their base is uh, molasses so I'm guessing this is probably column still and I don't think it's one of the one of the wooden column still so I'm guessing this is probably on one of on one of the the, um, the copper column stills it's really pungent um, I mean, I love this kind of stuff because it's kind of raw, it's in your face, but I think it's just a little bit, a little bit too unevolved. Yes, it's 10 years old and you would think at 10 years old it should theoretically be ready for bottling, but I think I would have just left this a little bit longer, just kind of remove a few more of those sort of impurities um, because they do tend to be rather over dominating. Um, I mean, that yes, there's a little bit of banana underneath, a little bit of green fruit, touch of oak, but it's it's really difficult to see past that sort of pungent, um, oily, spirity kind of character. Which, like I said, although is really really interesting, I'm, I would a little bit more balance. I think I, I would want to see personally. Anyway, let's see what the palette gives us. Quite raw, intense, oily, simple. Um, it's a little bit of, of dried tropical fruit, um, a little bit of spice. 
maybe it's the ABV, I mean, it's, uh, it is 57%. Um, th there's a bit of a tightness on the finish, there's a shortness to it. Um, it's, a, it's got a pleasant aftertaste. The, the, the sweetness does come kind of back on the aftertaste. You're getting a little bit of sweeter sort of apricot, a bit of sweet banana, um, sort of sub molassy kind of notes. Maybe a little bit more granulated sugar than molasses. It's certainly not dark and treacly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I'll put a little drop of water with it and just see if that kind of lengthens things or or brings out something else. Because, like I said, it's a little bit a little bit too too young. I think at at this present moment, time. I would have just given it maybe another two two to sort of three years in the cast just to sort of get a bit more um, impurity out of it. Yeah, it's not really not done an awful lot um, for it. Has to be said, it's still pretty um it's pretty immature. Let's see what the palette has done now. Yeah, it's not really done a huge amount of favours, it has to be said. It's made it a little bit sugar watery, it has to be said. It's all kind of sort of, not gone pear shaped, um, but the intensity, which seems to be the sort of main sort of focus of the, uh, of, of, of the character of the spirit, is kind of gone. It doesn't really sort of bring in a great deal of wood notes um, or dried fruit or... Yeah, it's a shame, but these things kind of happen. I just, like I said, I think I've really just left this a little bit longer. Right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show up. I think, on the whole, um, single cask uh, range are pretty good and certainly uh, uh, I've decided to buy some for the shop and they will be hopefully uh, arriving this week so they'll be up on the website so if any of them sound like your kind of cup of tea um, and yes I have bought the Macduff anyway um, there was a comment I think a few weeks ago somebody basically saying and I don't know whether they meant it as a criticism or just an observation that everything was wonderful that everything I tasted was brilliant um, and my my comment was well no it isn't I mean I don't like to to uh, you know taste bad whiskey and I don't think any of these were bad uh, any criticism I tend to give I think is measured and relevant to uh, to to what we're tasting and a couple of these you know just didn't tick my box I mean you know it's one man's opinion at the end of the day and and although I've been doing this for a long time other people may well disagree but. No disagreeing on the Macduff. I mean, blown away by the Macduff. I mean, you know, probably my favourite bottling of the whole lot purely because you just don't expect Macduff to be that good. So, um, savour. Savour and buy this. That's all I can say because if you ever find another cask or bottling of Macduff that's as, half as good as that, then, well, savour that one as well because they're very, very few and far between. Um, the, the Milton Duff, I think just classic Milton Duff, lovely Highland kind of character, herbal, you know, ticks all the right boxes, heathery, honeyed, you know, all that kind of stuff. Nice maturity, good, good cask, I think. Um, Tom and Tool, yeah, I have tasted a few Tom and Tool single cask bottlings of Tom and Tools in, in, in the past, which haven't quite lived up to the distillery bottling and of course obviously the distillery has a lot more casks to choose from and sometimes with single cask whiskies yes you're getting a uniqueness to it but sometimes you're almost getting a component sometimes they're just it's just not quite there this one definitely is i mean this is a lovely lovely tom and tool so um that will be on the shelf hopefully next week uh the invergordon um like i said quality wise don't have an issue with it it's certainly not a horrible whiskey i just think that I think I've just tasted more complex and interesting grains um, and that's the only reason that, that uh, um, I wouldn't go for that particular bottling. English whiskey, got no problem with that whatsoever. I've yet to taste a poor whiskey from them and uh, long may it go on hopefully or carry on as the case may be. Um, I think uh, David Fitt and all the guys at the distillery are just doing an amazing job and I love them to bits it has to be said and like I said spot on, spot on bottling it has to be said. And finally the Guyana Diamond Rum. Now 
Um, like I said, I just think that just needed a little bit more time in the cask, personally. I, I don't think it had, had long enough to remove the um, heavy impurities, the sort of... You know, it just needed a bit more time just to mellow out and gain a bit more complexity from, from, from being in cask. And this is the thing, sometimes you sort of look at something and you think, well, it should be ready about now. <laughs> it's been there in a cask for long enough and... Um, and I don't know. I'm not necessarily. I'm not just talking about this particular bottling. I'm just making a comment in general. But sometimes, you know, um, uh, bottlers, independents will be looking at sort of like the ratio between age and obviously ABV and thinking, well, that's getting a bit low. That's probably not going to last a bit longer. We best get that bottled. And yeah, it might not be sort of quite at that point in time. But you know, you can. You don't want to sort of roll the dice and. Um, and other times, it's obviously, you know, you've got to bottle things, um, and maybe sometimes think casks get bottled that little bit too soon, and and I think that this is probably one of those instances. But I think on the whole, I think uh, obviously Ben Ben seems to know what he's doing. He knows his whiskey. He's obviously bottling some really good quality stuff. Um, and you know, if you if you like the sound of them, like I said, you can either sort of like uh, eventually you know, purchase them from from us, or you can obviously buy them directly from from um, Ben himself via, via their website. So hopefully you'll give them a go, give them a give them a try out, and uh, and see what you think. So so anyway, that's uh, this week's episode of the show in the bag, and I'm desperately looking for something that's uh, got a little dribble left in it. Um, anyway, so uh, I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the show. Next week um, will be something different, I think. Uh, I think it's about time we looked at something other than whiskey, and so, yeah, okay, I can hear you groaning and going, oh, no, not a bloody another gin episode. Yeah, right, so, um, I've got, like I said, you know, I've got I've got these episodes kind of backed up, and we've got to the point where, anyway, all I have to say is uh, good ramming and uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Can you keep it down, please? Um, can you keep it down, please? I'm filming. Have you not put that in the video? No, I'm going to cut that out. Oh, you not get what you can get it down yet? About half an hour. I'm starving. Well, you have yours then. Anyway, right, look, I'm going to start. Oh, hold on, the girls will pay for me to get my hair done. So I'm going to the hairdresser at 9 o'clock.